have to pre-apologize if I, uh, there's a part of my talk where I'm, where I'm kind of like stumbling. It's because when I flew in on Sunday, I was using Keynote with iCloud, and apparently some sort of sync thing happened, and, and a good chunk of my slides disappeared. So uh, I've been redoing, redoing the slides this week. I think I got it. I actually like them more, but uh, yeah, I kind of pooped a little, so it's, <laughs> but uh, the demo app is completely fine, so that's really the important, the important part at the end, so. You can still talk, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> So who, who has uh, actually used RX Swift already? Who, who has tried to get involved with it and stopped at the documentation? Okay. That's, that's kind of where I was. That was the genesis of the whole talk, so thank you for coming. How similar is it to RX Java? Uh, I have coworkers using RX Java, and I think it's, uh, uh, it fits better. A little bit. Um, I don't know if it's the team, the team that ported it in, in Java that they did a cleaner, cleaner job. Uh, at least it feels more like it's a natural language rather than an add-on. Uh, but overall, I think having learned RX, RX Java or RX Swift, I've been able to look at RX Java code and I get it. I get it. So same basic idea. Yeah, pretty close. Yep. yep. Are the different language flavors of RX? Um, so the, the original obviously is .NET. I'll talk about that in a little bit, but uh, the, the ones that are like one to one to what they originally did with .NET, uh, I think PHP is one of them. Uh, Scala, Scala is another one. Um, not all of the operators are in Sur and Swift yet, so and actually we'll show you that in the, the demo. Uh, but they're doing a good job. I think Swift, Swift is a good match for, for React about so. I'm not, like prior to maybe March, April, I've never even tried Reactive before. So uh, uh, this is all new stuff for me relatively. Uh, the whole idea of, idea of me giving the talk is that this is the stuff I had to go through to figure out Rx, Rx and uh, it's, it'll definitely give you all a jumping off point, but, but I do have a, Real world of RX slide at the end, so I will talk hopefully, hopefully a little bit about experiences with it. So, almost ready to start. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, for if you've got multiple teams on, on .NET and Java and PHP and JavaScript or Swift. Is there a lot of value in trying to get everyone to move towards, towards this family? Uh, I would say no, especially especially because if you try a .NET developer, uh, they're going to want Link, and S Swift doesn't have Link. So uh, that is a major foundation of Reactive ActiveX on .NET is Link support. I mean, that being said, there are equivalent equivalent sort of things on Swift, but uh, it's not like oh, I know I, I know RX. I'm going to instantly know how to use it on every platform. Um, there are different namings for some things. Uh, the concept, concept, how parameters are passed, or I guess not parameters, but how the callbacks, callbacks affect the durables are a little different. So uh, it won't, it won't hurt. So there would have to be maybe some architectural changes. Probably less architectural and just more uh, uh, like, especially if there's not a if there's an operator in .NET that it, that it doesn't exist in Swift yet. They imported it. You may have to actually create that yourself, uh, uh, or figure out what to replace it with. So I think it would be easier for someone to uh, go from, oh, we're good? Okay. So I'm going to start, but we can definitely get back, get back to your questions. So this is the Swift and Reactive X talk. If you're, not, if you're not expecting RX, then there's the door. But uh, thank you for all for, com for coming. <laughs> uh, it's definitely a topic that I really wanted to give just because, just because it took me a lot of effort to learn it, and I still don't feel like I know it 100%. Uh, I don't think I ever will. Uh, but uh, I appreciate you all coming. Uh, I'm Aaron Douglas, and I work on the WordPress, WordPress for iOS app every day. And we actually started to include include RX Swift in our application. And I thought, I need a, de need a deadline. I need something to force me to learn RX other than just a piece of our app. Our app. So I said, I know. I'll submit a talk to 360 iDev. 
so that gave, that gave me my deadline and it forced me to learn RX Swift. Um, and uh, uh, that's why I'm here to give the talk. And I work remote full time uh, uh, through Automatic and I love my job. So reactive itself, functional, like you may not even really understand what those, what those are all about. So really important for you to understand some of the concepts and steps that go into uh, what reactive programming is, what functional programming is, uh, and the idea of what sequences even are in Swift. So, so like reactive programming, it's a buzzword, you probably have heard it a lot, uh, but it's basically a programming pattern uh, surrounding data flow. So it's the, it's the transition of data throughout your application uh, and the propagation of change. So, so as new data comes in, uh, events happen, it's the, the, the push of that data around the application. A good example of, of reactive style is an Excel spreadsheet. So if you have references to sys to cells within the spreadsheet and you change one, they all kind of change with it if you have, if you have formulas that reference that cell. That's reactive programming right there. Uh, the idea with reactive programming though is that all of these data changes are also, are also asynchronous. They may happen synchronously from like new typing or some, or some electrons come across the wire and they change data. Uh, but, the, but the idea is that your app doesn't have to deal with them immediately. It's Asynchronously, asynchronously, man, asynchronously managed. Uh, functional personal programming is, um, you've, had a, you've had some exposure to this obviously if you've, if you've, if you've used Swift, um, but the, the definition is it relies upon, upon treating computational uh, change as a function of mathematical functions and, and avoids changing state and mutable data. Uh, what it really, mean, really means is that we have these cool functions called MapReduce filter. So, our, so RX Swift really expounds upon those. That's that's really the foundation of everything. Uh, we want to avoid state. So if you've ever created a class, class with a property in that class, and you've somehow retained an instance to another another class, well, that's retaining state. The concept with functional programming programming is that each method or each function that you call doesn't rely upon anything anything else. Anything that function needs is passed in as a parameter, and whatever that whatever that function does gets kicked out as the result. Immutable data, that means that any type of data that your function uses, uh, it can't actually change it. The idea is whatever the function does, does will generate a new piece of data. It will create a new instance or a struct, struct uh, for it to pass back. So your original data is unchanged, and that, and that makes it a lot clearer in your application what is actually causing the data to change. To change. And we have the idea of the declarative paradigm, paradigm rather than the imperative paradigm. If you want to dig into that, it's a whole, whole thing. Uh, the idea is that we really want to do functions instead of class classes and uh, everything being uh, like the big O notation, notation, like you can actually calculate what your function does because all of the work is being done, being done within there. It's like, it's like a mathematical formula. Um, there, um, there are two major implementations. Uh, you're probably familiar with RX Swift because you came to this, came to this talk. Uh, but there's also reactive Cocoa or Rack. Um, I, won't be, I won't be talking about any of those at all, actually. Uh, only with RX Swift, so there's no, diff no differences that I'll be talking about. There are, and there's plenty of articles because there's kind of, a, kind of a religious camp for each of the, the two implementations. Um, um, thing to note is that RX Swift is not functional reactive programming. programming. That in itself is completely different. Well, not completely, but it's, it's different. Um, RX Re ReactiveX uh, deals, with, deals with discrete values emitted over time, whereas functional reactive program programming is dealing with uh, a constant change. It's dealing with um, um, values that change continuously over time. It's a minor distinct distinction, but it's a major difference in how you're supposed to understand the differences. So it's func functional and reactive programming, not functional reactive programming. <laughs> Two different, thing, different things. Uh, so the question then really is, what is what is RX Swift? It's based on ReactiveX, and ReactiveX was originally designed for the .NET platform. It, it was using a technology called Link, which is a way to create, it's, they look like SQL queries or SQL queries in your code, but it, it lets you to manage your data um, a little bit more declaratively. And, and ReactiveX was created to create ways to observe, observe data being changed in different pieces of your application and to respond to those changes. changes. Uh, it, there's a couple different ports, and we kind of talked about, about that before the talk. Uh, Java, JavaScript, .NET, obviously, Scala, Gala, Clojure, Swift, Kotlin, PHP. There's a ton more. Uh, uh, they're not necessarily all implemented fully. Swift is probably about 90% about there for all of the operators that exist in the .NET flavor. flavor. Uh, but it's pretty wide well used. Um, it's kind of hard to grok, so not a lot of people are using it in the Swift community yet. But 
Uh, there are some definite players that are pushing for it. And it really extends the observer pattern, and we are going to talk about the observer patterns pattern, so if you're not super familiar, it should be much clearer. Uh, it's, it's basically, it's, it's going to support a sequence of data or events. Um, has a ton, has a ton of operators for composing things. So if you have data coming in from two different two different streams, you can combine them together. Uh, you can filter things out. Uh, but what's nice about Arc Swift is that it kind of eliminates all the dealings with with threading and uh, synchronization. Uh, you can specify specify what thread things happen on, but they don't block you from actually doing your work like they like they kind of do with. Uh, I guess regular uh, imperative programming. Uh, you can also think of an observable is is kind of a kind of a push for so when the data comes in, it pushes the changes rather than your applic application having to pull and wait for the and keep checking to see if data's changed. Changed. Uh, it's also really also related to the iterable pattern, which is really the whole basis of what Rx, Rx Swift is. It's you're iterating over a change of data. Uh, in Swift, there's two protocols that are really important that you understand that there are equivalents in Arc Swift, and that's sequence types type and generator type. And I will cover those briefly as well if you're not super familiar. Here. So the observer pattern, uh, it's, uh, it's a software design pattern. It's in the original Gang of Four book. And it's, it's um, an object which is called the subject. It maintains a, a list of its dependents. So it, it knows who cares about itself. And any time that, uh, that, that data is changed or it change, changes, it will broadcast to all the things that care about it. Uh, you should be super familiar with hopefully at least one of the patterns, uh, impl uh, implementations of the observer pattern. That's NF NS Notification Center. And here you can add an observer to uh, a particular class. And then any time that change happens, it emits the event. And then you can subscri subscribe to that event throughout your application. So this is the observer pattern. This is fundamentally what Rx Swift is doing, but with a much prettier uh, interface. Interface. And if you like UML, UML, here's the UML for observer pattern. Uh, what it comes down to is that the 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 observer, the thing on the left, upper left, uh, is notified when side when something happens, and the observer has to register itself with the sub the subject or the thing being observed. And the the thing being observed has to know that it needs to emit a notification to all of its uh, listeners when something happens. I don't really necessarily like UML, but it's good to have the pattern here. If you ever need to, re need to reference it for some clarity, um, that's sort of what it looks like. It's like. How many people actually use UML on a regular basis? OK, there's, okay, there's a couple. Good. Uh, so the iterator pattern is the other, the other pattern that's really important to understand. Uh, it's a design pattern which the it, uh, the iterator is used to traverse a container and access the container's elements. elements. So uh, what it boils down to is like the for each type of method that you can take a, a container of data or an array and, and loop through it. You don't have to care how that data is accessed. You just say, I want the next one. And so the UL for this one, it shows that the client client or the application code that you're writing, uh, it re retrieves the iterator, iterator by saying get iterator. And then there's, in Swift, there's only one. It's get, it's get next. But ideally, there's the get first. So if you need to go back to the beginning of the container, container, uh, you can go, still loop through all the things that are inside of that. Super exciting, I know. Uh, so the, the equivalent things then, whoops, uh, the equivalent things are, are generators and sequences in Swift. This the generator type is the iterator. It uh, allow, allows you to access the element and the associated type of element. And then there's one method uh, next. So, so if you have something that implements generator type, you know that it's containing data, that there's, that there's more than one piece of data, and you can ask for the next piece of data once you get that one. Super simple, but this protocol really enables a lot of things, things to happen kind of magically. Uh, the example that I have here is, there is a countdown generator. So it will uh, let you loop through, through things backwards in your container. And Effective, effectively, the generator type uh, provides the next element, and when there are when there are no more elements left, it returns nil. And otherwise, it keeps track of what, el what element it's looking at. And then the example on the bottom—I don't know if you can actually see it all that well—is just it's looping through, uh, doing a while loop, and it says while there's a next, there's a next, it prints it out. So we started with an array of A, B, C. This this code actually does things in reverse, so then it shows element two is not being the first one, this one, and it goes C, B, A. Sequence type, 
is the way of um, it's, it's the way of iterating through a generator. So if you have a sequence type, then your whatever your class is has a generator, and because you have a generator, that means you can loop through all the elements. So the so the sequence type only just uh, provides the generator, but there's a there's a relationship between the two protocols, and it's kind of asymmetrical. Um, every sequence has a, has a generator, but not every generator has a sequence. And then the example code then would be, if you have a reverse sequence, so, and so we want things to go in reverse, then inside generate returns an instance an instance of a countdown generator given an array. And then and on the bottom it just shows that you can either use the generator directly, or you can say, can say for i in reverse sequence, and it knows how to traverse the data that's within inside of inside of it. So that's uh, that, that's the uh, sequence type and generator in Swift. Uh, what, uh, what Arc Swift really does is it creates an equivalent pattern using observables. So an observable, um, observable sequence is really is really just a sequence behind the scenes. Uh, the key advantage for Arc Swift's observable observables uh, versus Swift's sequence type is that it can also receive the elements asyn asynchronously. It doesn't have to have them all done ahead of time. The observer type. Um, is the, the thing that's watching something happen. So the idea is you care, you care about when someone's clicking the mouse or when someone's tapping on the screen. You can subs subscribe to those events and you say, I'm an observer. I really care about when these events, these events happen. So your observer type has to implement this, pro this protocol and it'll receive a, an event in the function on. on. That event is uh, enum and it has three different types of events that you can, that you can receive. Next, which is just a normal thing, so if you have another piece of data, It'll send the event as a next, and it contains the data that is part of that event. That event. Uh, otherwise, there could be an error. So if something happens with your network, and you're trying to receive a network event, uh, or if the, the, se the sequence has a termination, if it's not an infinite number, uh, it, you can receive the, receive the completed sequence, or completed event to your sequence. So observable type is equivalent uh, to the, the sequence type. This is the thing that contains the iteration. It's the thing that loops over stuff. Uh, observable type has a method called subscribe, and that's equivalent to the generate method of sequence type. So the idea is that when you have uh, something that can be observed, so like, uh, like in the case of a network event uh, or mouse clicks, uh, you can subs subscribe to, those, to that uh, emitter of events. And there's a convertible type. So if you already have something that exists in your code and you want, and you want to be able to potentially convert it into an observable, you can implement observable convertible type, and then it'll return something something that can be watched in your code. So if you're trying to convert all of your code over to Rx, to Rx Swift, effectively you're going to be creating a bunch of these as observables. Uh, uh, you're going to want to convert your code that way so that things can be watched within your, your app application. Uh, Observables, observables are still kind of nebulous, uh, but the idea is that you can visualize any, se any sequence of data within your application using the simple design of uh, letters and numbers and dashes. The idea is that uh, the first, se first sequence, one, two, three, four, five, six, that's the actual data. The dash dashes in between represent time between those events. Because remember, everything with thing with Rx Swift is asynchronous. Doesn't mean it's that an array may, may, may not have six elements already. It may take time for those six elements to generate. The uh, pipe at the end means that's termination, so you would receive the completed event. Uh, the second one is an example where you're receiving data, and then there's an error, there's an error. And then the end one is infinite. So you will always be, always be subscribed to an event. It never really ends until your application's done. It's really, really easy to create an observable. Uh, in this case, it's observing just a single piece of data, the letter X. Letter X. Not super useful, uh, but for a demonstration here, what it's showing, it's showing is that for just the letter X, we're going to create an observable. And when, when uh, the X, when it's kind of pumped into the observable, uh, the subscription is going to print the event. At the end, you have, to, you have to add every single observer subscription to a disposable bag. And I'll talk, I'll talk about that in a bit. But effectively, what that is, is that's ARC for ARC Swift. But if you don't add something to a disposable bag, then it's going to potentially leak memory at some, at some point. And so that's an example, example with a single element. Here you can pass in uh, an array of items, items, and you should be able to, 
I, this is part of my slide slides that I had to change here. Right? I used to have output at the bottom. Uh, but yeah, ideally what will happen is, happen is that you'll just see a printout of WX, WXYX. Uh, this is also kind of uh, subscribe and describe next is a shortcut. Like you don't care about if there's an error, if it's completed or, or um, any of the other items with the event type. Uh, you only care about, care about when something happens for next. Uh, there is a way to do, and I'll show it in a bit here, there's a way to do, actually do for each of the event types. This, this is uh, a shorthand way, so like I showed, uh, observable type convertible. convertible. Uh, Rx Swift also provides these shortcuts already in the code, so, so you can take any Swift array and do dot to observable at the end of it and convert it, convert it in, into an observable in Rx Swift. So in your code, you can say, say here's my array, dot to observable, and then you can subscribe to those events as events that get emitted out. You can do that to uh, an array, array, dictionary, uh, or a set, or pretty much anything that's a sequence type, you can turn into an observable. Let's see, let's see here. So that's, sub subscribe next is the shorthand, um, but you can subscribe to each of the, each of the four different types. Uh, on next is when there's an element there for you, for you, on error is when there's an error, on completed is when the sequence is done, and then, and then on dispose is when it actually is evicted from memory. Pretty much, you're going to be using subscribe next everywhere. So now you know how to subscribe to data. Uh, you understand what an observable, observable is. Hopefully, um, the one, the cool thing about RX Swift is not, is not necessarily the observables. We can do that with Notification Center. It's all of the, op the operators that you can perform on these streams of data. Uh, there's combining, combining, transforming, filtering, conditional, mathematical, aggregate, connectable, connectable error handling, and debugging. Um, but you can also create your own custom ob ob uh, operators. And I'm actually going to show that to you in the demo that uh, there's, an there's an operator that doesn't exist yet in the Swift, in Arc Swift, but is there in, in the ReactiveX. Um, there's a, it's called, called pausable. So, so if you are able to tell the, the stream to pa pause until you're ready to receive more data. Um, for, some reason, for some reason, they decided not to put that in Swift yet, but it's actually a really simple operator. Uh, there is a website called rxmarbles.net, and I have the URL in the, the slide, so you can you'll be able to see it when you actually have working internet. Uh, it's uh, an, inter an interactive website, and it shows every single operator in Rx. And like like here is it's demonstrating the map. So we've been talking about observable observables, observable types, and streams. The top one is the incoming stream of data. Stream of data. So we have these things coming in over time. Number one, number two, number two, number three, and they're emitted within your, your sequence. Then we have an, have an operator, which is the map operator, and we're saying we want x to, be, x to be multiplied by 10, and we return that value back. So it's leaving the original, original stream alone. That data is unchanged. It's immutable. It's not being modified. But, but a second observable is being created with that modified data in it. So what it looks like in code is that we're creating a disposable bag, which is just, I, I put that in every example. But we're observing one, two, and three, and and then we map that to, and then the dollar sign zero is just is just a shorthand to pull the element out of the map, just like in Swift, um, and we multiply it by ten, and we subscribe to that. So it's taking the observ the observable of one, two, and three, putting the map operator on it, which which then creates another observable, and we're subscribing to that modified uh, stream of data. So when that, you actually execute this code in the playground, you'll see, you'll see 10, 20, and 30, not 1, 2, and 3. But if you, wanted, if you wanted to see both, you could do a subscription on observable of 1, 2, 1, 2, and 3, have that print out, and then also do the map on the original observable. What it would do is it would show 1, 10, 10, 2, 20, 3, 30, because they're all happening at the same time. And, well, not the same time, but they're happening in a sequence. It's not going to be an instant thing. thing. Uh, there's filter, so uh, you can take a stream of data coming in and you can apply a filter to it so that you, so that you only get certain elements on the other side. An, ex an example is here, I just I want all elements over 10, and, and then we only get 30, 22, and 60 out of the original uh, array that was, that was passed in. Uh, uh, there are more complex ones like scan. Uh, what scan is doing is it's adding in the result from the previous item to itself. So it's sort of like the Fibonacci sequ G sequence, um, if that's how you want to calculate it. So here, here uh, one is emitted. Well, there's no previous element, so it's just one. And then you have two. Well, then that adds in three. So it's fairly straightforward. 
uh, but you can also pass it a seed value. So here I say scan 0 and 0, which means I don't want to start with any seed value, and then it passes in the aggregate and the new value value, and then you can do the operation. I was showing just addition, but you could do anything here. Thing here. And then we have merge, and that lets you take two separate data streams, or two, two, two separate streams or observables, and merge their elements together. They have, to be, they have to be of the same type, so in this case they're both integers. Uh, but you can see, because of the way that it's showing it over time, when one either stream, stream emits, that's when it's emitted in the merged stream at the bottom. So it's not, it's not going to hold on to things. Uh, you can actually do operators where it's going collect, to collect things up and emit it at a certain point. But in this case, just the regular merge just puts, puts those two streams together. So in code, you can see I created, there's a thing called published subject. It's an observable that can also so, uh, observe other things. Uh, but what I came down, came down to is, uh, you can see at the, the code on the bottom, I'm either uh, emitting, emitting 20, uh, 20, 40, and 60 on the first subject. One is on the, is on the second subject. Uh, and on the right-hand side is the code from the, 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 the merge observable at top. And you can see they're just being emitted in line together. So that, that code matches that. And as I mentioned, RX Marbles, Marbles is definitely the site to go to if you're... Because operators seriously are super confusing. I mean, RX Swift in itself is super confusing, but when you can visualize how things change, uh, it's awesome. When you're, when you're on that site, all of these marbles can actually be moved. It's not super obvious, yes. So if you want to see how changing when something is emitted affects, affects how that operator works, you can drag it around on the screen. It's pretty cool, pretty cool. Uh, uh, so I mentioned uh, disposing, uh, and that's equivalent of ARC. You can do a manual dispose on any subscription, uh, but, that, but that's kind of a bad smell. You really don't want to do that. You can do that in an example code or if you're, code or if you're trying to play around things in a playground. Uh, but if, if you're manually calling dispose on, dispose on something, that means that you're probably doing something wrong. Um, there is, so like an example that I'm, that I'm going to show, I have a timer running in the application and there's a way to cancel it, cancel it through the UI. I was originally calling dispose on the timer because I didn't need it, I need it anymore. Uh, but that really wasn't the right way to do it. So what I ended up doing, up doing is that I implemented pausable so that when somebody taps the button, uh, to pause the timer, the timer, I'm actually saying to the stream, just wait until the next time we need to get events from, events from it. Um, there's another operator called take until. Well, you can get into that. Um, the idea is that just wherever you're creating, creating a subscription, you want to make sure you're adding that subscription to the disposable bag. And you, and you only really need one per view controller. You could share it through your whole application. But the idea is that when your view controller is gone, then anything that you were doing with RX Swift there, there is uh, deallocated from memory. So there's a lot of things that you can do with RX Swift with, with just uh, what comes uh, with the, the original real reactive X operators, uh, but a lot of the magic with RX Swift is, Swift is that there's a thing called RX Coco. If you've done any Mac development, you're pretty you should be familiar at least with uh, being able to uh, look at look at um, uh, bindings, so you can bind data models to your your UI. Well, they have the equivalent type of thing in RX Coco, so that, so that you can actually bind to a button, so that when the button's clicked, that turns into an, into an observable event. So you don't really have to look at uh, all of the, all of the events in Interface Builder, or you know, like um, in, in this case, I have a, I have a stepper in our example app, and whenever you click the plus or plus or minus button in the stepper, it uh, emits the RX value event, uh, which is the equivalent of um, uh, value changed. In Coco, so all you have to do is get a reference to it, to it, do RX value, and then subscribe to it, so that when they click the button, uh, you can change the value uh, that you're retaining within your class. Uh, Coco bindings, yeah. I, 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 I've never done Mac development, so I've never done. Uh, it's basically bindings, um, um, native bindings, yeah. So it's it's the most equivalent thing with RX with RX Coco. Uh, it gives you RX Swift magic if, if things that all. Um, I'll actually just show you the screen. All of these things, plus a heck of a lot more, have additional bindings or additions or additional functions available to you to make your life with RX Swift a lot easier. Uh, I would say that if you use table views with RX with RX Swift, it's not super magical. It's actually kind of ugly, uh, but I think that's going to it's going to improve. Uh, so anytime that you have a data source for a table, there's a there's a, a binding you have to or not a binding you have a, a function you have to add add. Uh, 
And so you still have to create a data source. It's kind of funky. I didn't, I didn't get into that because this is an introduction to RxSwift. Swift. Uh, there's a ton of, ton of example codes out there that show you how to use RxSwift uh, as, the, as the data source behind a table. So uh, I know you guys are all super thrilled about everything, everything I've been talking about. But I have an example, and I think this is really where you're going to be, you're going to be enlightened on how RxSwift works. Uh, I love tater tots. I admit it. Admit it. Um, so I created an application to calculate the, the perfect time for having the tater tots in your oven, based on the number of number of tots that you want to cook. And there goes the microphone. Oops. Okay. Uh, so the so the, the number of tater tots is inputted. You hit start for the timer, and then and the timer spins. And when your timer runs out, that means your tater tots are perfect. Perfect. So I originally wrote this code. Change the resolution here. There we go. Okay. Okay. So, what's the reality? The reality of actually using RX Swift in your own application? Uh, I, like I said, I work, I work on the WordPress for iOS app, and uh, we started using it in March. I was, I was really confused by all the code I was seeing, so I said I, I was going to give a talk. Seriously, like three weeks after I submitted this and it was accepted, we decided to rip it out, rip it out of our application. Um, the only reason I can tell you why is that, is that we have a completely distributed team, so it's really hard to kind of get everybody on the bandwagon on new technology like this, uh, especially when the paradigms are so completely different. Uh, I think what really did it for us is that if you do a breakpoint within your code, code uh, the stack trace is about 40 lines long. So you're like this, this far deep into RX Swift, and then you're like, wait, what actually caused that to happen? happen? So there's a huge disconnect uh, for traditional programming, traditional traditional breakpoints to figure out like what's making something actually go wrong. Um, um, so that really means that you're going to be using MS log statement a lot, which it's it's kind of sta kind of stabby, but um, it doesn't mean that it's not plausible. There's plenty of companies using using it in their own applications in the App Store, uh, but you got to make sure it's kind of like kind of like brought in in the right way into your team. It's not something you can just throw on them and say, hey, "We're going to do this." Uh, so obviously this is just literally scratching the surface of RxSwift. Swift. Um, I don't expect all of you here to leave and like be coding your applications with RxSwift. Swift. The first place I'm going to definitely go to is the GitHub repo for RxSwift. Swift. Uh, Swift. There is actually a ton of documentation there. It's just it's not not organized logically for some reason. Um, so I, how I did it is I literally went through every link and I opened up a new tab in my browser. So every single link on that page, and it was all good stuff. But just try to consume that and figure out figure out what is RX Swift. You could be reading for two hours and not really have a good idea. Um, functional reactive programming. This this uh, gist has a bunch of links to it, and it's kind of a mix of F R and R and P, or functional and reactive and functional reactive. Uh, um, they don't make the distinction. This. Um, Max Alexander, his talk on Realm IO, really awesome. It actually kind of opened up my mind, my mind to a lot of things. And then there's RX Swift Slack. So if you ever get like really com confused, uh, there's a Slack that you can ask people. People. Um, and if you want the tater tot timer code, it's there. It's there as well. Uh, there is a branch specifically for the RX Swift stuff. Uh, so if you ever need anything, or you want some some suggestions or help, or people to point you at, uh, I'm on I'm Astro Astro Bodies pretty much everywhere GitHub, Twitter. Um, definitely feel free to reach out, reach out. I'm more than willing to help everybody. Cool. Thanks. If you have, if you have questions, let me know. I'm gonna hang around for a bit. I have the uh, the um, stump thing to go to, but uh, I can answer a few questions before we leave. Really, really Dispose bag seems to be analogous to like the NSR release pool. Yeah, it's it's yeah. The, uh, uh, dispose bag is sort of like a auto release pool, but it's um, more declarative than than, than you would expect. Uh, nope. When Swift gets rid of that, when it's no longer important with Arc, then that, then that releases everything with Arc. So. Yeah, so like in the view controller instance, I made it a property on that uh, view controller controller class. So when Arc decides to get rid of the whole view controller instance, then all, all the other stuff will go with it. Yep. And you don't have to worry about weak self. self. That's the awesome thing. It handles it all. Yep. I have, I have a little bit of self. First of all, I, I, you can specify like, the blocks of which thread, right? 
Uh, so, so if you're not using RX Coco, then no. But if you are using RX RX Coco, then you can decide, you can tell it what scheduler to be on, and that's equivalent to what to what thread. Uh, there's main scheduler, and then you can create your own schedulers.